Untitled Goose Game is enormously fun, and of course it is. What's not to love? You play as a goose who has a journal full of prerogatives, the end goal of which is to create chaos and upheaval in the small English canal town in which you find yourself. To ruin this woman's painting, this man's slippers, to lock the gardener out of his garden, to scare the little boy with glasses until he locks himself in the phone booth, to break a dartboard, the list goes on. And yet, for all its fun, I haven't seen a lot of videos breaking down its broader meaning. A lot of reaction videos, not a lot of analysis. So I thought I might try to give this game its due and talk about why I think it's so unique and, most impressive of all, an example of a video game being not just art, but, more specifically, a video game being classical music. I understand why people haven't tried to analyze this game, why they haven't tried to quote-unquote break this game down. Outside the fun gameplay, there doesn't seem to be much to go on. Unlike, say, Journey, there aren't huge orchestral emotional cues, surreal gargantuan vistas, or soulful multiplayer exchanges. In other words, there's nothing that necessarily invites the classic video games are art interpretation. Usually, that video games are art interpretation is reserved for serious, abstract, non-traditional games like Journey or Edith Finch. And unlike, say, the relatively more traditional The Last of Us, there's no dialogue or high-stakes story full of psychological realism, nothing that would invite that other classic interpretation of video games are art in the same way movies and TV are art. Untitled Goose Game isn't obviously abstract art, and it isn't obviously narrative art. In Untitled Goose Game, you don't traverse a desert, and you don't get into arguments with Joel. You just honk, and the townspeople talk to each other or themselves in mumbles rather than sentences. The only language here is written, the notes which tell you what to do, but not how to do it. So the way the game tells you about itself, the game's language, isn't found in words, but in music. Not in its script, but in its soundtrack. Untitled Goose Game expresses itself through WC. And for those who might think I'm reading too much into this, it should be noted that the game itself instructs us to attend closely to sound. As a stealth game, we're acutely aware of the fact that other characters can hear us, that we're audible. When we're playing this game, we're thinking about sound all the time. Am I making noise? What surface am I waddling on? Should I honk and surprise them? Will they hear me if I run? Should I try to stand still? Sound is one of the key ways by which the goose makes itself known to the other characters and thus, one of the key ways the game makes itself known to us. So, it makes sense for us as players to pay close attention to the game's sound, which, of course, would include the game's music. Also, before going further, I should just note that I'm not a musicologist, just someone who loves WC and Untitled Goose Game. So there's not going to be a lot of technical musical analysis here, more just a broad thematic discussion. With the exception of two tracks by Dan Golding, who arranged and adapted the music here, Untitled Goose Game's soundtrack consists entirely of one thing, adaptive versions of Debussy's preludes. Given how central sound is to this game, and given how central WC is to this game's sound, it only follows that the meaning of Untitled Goose Game can be found by taking a long look at what Debussy means as a composer and as a man. Hopefully, once we have a bit of background here, we'll be able to see that Untitled Goose Game is the closest version of a video game adaptation of a piece of classical music I've ever seen. If Debussy were a game designer, he would have made Untitled Goose Game. So, who is Debussy? He's a French composer who was born in 1862 and died in 1918. His most famous piece is the Claire de Lune, and he changed music forever. Debussy believed in freedom at all costs. Even as a boy, he didn't want to fit in, getting a position at the Paris Conservatory at age 10, only to continually mess around and flat out refuse to play the way his teachers wanted him to. This would be the equivalent of getting a scholarship to Harvard only to blow spitballs from the back of the class. In his personal behavior and musical style, WC resisted traditional success and approval at every turn. However, he wasn't a rebel without a cause. To the contrary, this rebellion served a purpose. More than anything else, WC wanted to invent an entirely new musical language, which many musicians would claim he succeeded in doing. Pierre Boulez, maybe the most famous conductor and musical theorist in the 20th century, claimed that WC essentially created modern music with his piece, Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, a work that, for all its influence, is just 10 minutes long. Like his contemporary Eric Satie, Debussy wasn't afraid to write short. The important thing was leaving an impression on the listener, not communicating some deep story or eternal truth. Much as he, at a certain point, admired Wagner, who wrote these massively long operas full of stern and dramatic sweeping stories and deeply serious themes, Debussy ultimately identified against him, 
calling Wagner a sunset, which people mistook for the dawn. In other words, calling him a dead end and turning away from him. Debussy himself only wrote one opera, and it's not Wagnerian at all. And otherwise, he was perfectly content to work on a seemingly smaller scale, not on three-hour operas. There's a powerful humility in leaving the listener wanting more, to leave things unexplained, unargued, merely experienced, and not pedantically, ponderously understood. The most important thing was to provoke an unpredictable pleasure. You can probably already see the connection here between Debussy and Untitled Goose Game, which takes at most maybe three hours or so to beat, and allows the player's sense of curiosity and surprise to guide them, rather than relying on a more self-serious approach, like, say, God of War, with its major, nearly cinematic story. But what is it about Debussy's music that makes it modern? Most of all, it's an elusive quality that renders the music almost a mood piece, rather than something straightforward or rigidly structured, in which the conductor's choices are utterly predictable. Some would even say that in prioritizing flexibility, suggestion, and atmosphere, Debussy's free-flowing work, following non-traditional harmonic rules, has more in common with certain kinds of jazz than with what typically comes to mind when people think of classical music, something haughty, respectable, and self-important. From his earliest days, Debussy's instructors were frustrated that he seemed to deploy his considerable talents toward his own ends. He was bored by what he was supposed to do. One teacher, Emile Durand, wrote that Debussy would be an excellent pupil if he were less sketchy and less cavalier. He went on to call him desperately careless. And when Debussy at a young age won an incredibly prestigious prize, the Prix de Rome, he hated it, writing, I had a sudden vision of boredom and of all the worries that inevitably go together with any form of official recognition. I felt I was no longer free. After some time in Rome, where he was sent for a residency as part of his prize, he realized he had to follow his own way, writing, I'm sure the Institute would not approve, for naturally, it regards the path which it ordains as the only right one. But there is no help for it. I am too enamored of my freedom, too fond of my own ideas. Again, here one can think of Untitled Goose Game, set in an English town precisely because, according to its developers, this setting represented a, quote, properness, which was the antithesis of what the goose was all about. This focus on developing a counterintuitive approach, protecting your freedom, and upsetting a stuffy world stuck in its stuck-up ways calls to mind both the gleeful mission of Untitled Goose Game and the whole career of Debussy. Finally, it's worth noting that Debussy was also insanely chaotic in his personal life. He had an affair with his mentor's wife, had another affair with a singer while he was living with a girlfriend for six years, proposed to that singer then broke off that engagement, later ultimately left that original girlfriend for her good friend, driven to grief, that original girlfriend shot herself, but survived. Then, after Debussy married his ex's good friend, he divorced her barely five years later because he fell in love with yet another woman. That ex-wife was so upset about it, she too shot herself. Though she too survived, these kinds of scandals really turned people against Debussy, and he lost a lot of former friends and supporters just because he was such a cad in his personal life. He was literally the subject of anonymously circulated letters that criticized his personal life and, for what it's worth, also criticized his financial irresponsibility that led to him running up all kinds of debts. This is to say that Debussy wasn't just causing upheaval in the world of music, but basically caused chaos wherever he went, breaking up marriages, upsetting people, being made a deeply unwelcome presence in polite society. Again, here we have another similarity, the goose causing as much chaos as did Debussy, ruining the days and lives of others with not a care in the world for the consequences. Debussy's life, surely, wasn't easy, but the fruit of his stubbornly chaotic life is fun. The fun music he left behind, which lets us have fun too, even today. During his life, Debussy could only freely pursue fun by escaping from society, with its teachers and ex-girlfriends and debts, and escaping into music, a realm which transcends the human. Untitled Goose Game honors his memory by allowing us to transcend as well, and enter a world where chaos, curiosity, and surprise are relished and unpunished. We, the Goose, are essentially Debussy.